Earth's Changing Environment. Earth science is the study of Earth and its position in the universe. It is the combination of four disciplines. The first is geology, the study of history, structure, processes, and composition of Earth's surface down to the core. Oceanography, which is the study of Earth's oceans. Meteorology, which is the study of Earth's atmosphere, weather, and climate. And finally, astronomy, which is the study of the universe, which includes all matter, time, energy, and space. When we learn about Earth science, we need to use specific skills that allow us to observe and understand how Earth operates. In order to study the environment, we have to know how these skills help us. One of the first skills is observation. Observation is any fact that is obtained using one of the five senses. Scientific instruments, like this telescope, are used to extend our senses. A telescope, for example, makes it possible to observe planets and distant objects in space. This helps us develop ideas and theories about astronomy. Another skill are making inferences. An inference is an interpretation of an observation. It's your explanation of a fact that you, inter that you uh, received from your five senses. Inferences propose causes, conclusions, or explanations for what has been observed. If you make a prediction, just like a weather report, for a future event, it's a type of inference. It's based on observation. Getting back to space, like this picture of a galaxy, most of what we know about space and the universe is based on inferences developed by astronomers. These inferences are the work of many observations, sometimes completed by multiple scientists over multiple years. It's important to remember that inferences can be correct or incorrect. It depends on the evidence. Let's take a moment to practice making observations and inferences. I'm showing you this picture here of a rock clearly split in two. It looks like it's sitting in a lake or maybe a sea, maybe an ocean. Don't know for sure. I'm going to give you a couple of statements and I want you to think about whether it's an observation, factual information, or if it's an inference, an interpretation of facts. Ready? Here's the first one. These rocks weigh three tons. Is that an observation or is that an inference? If you said observation, you're correct. Because when we weigh things, when we get their mass, we're extending our senses. We're using an instrument to extend our senses and give us fact. Okay, that's an observation. Let's try this one. These rocks were carried by a glacier. It's a tricky one. Now, what's a glacier? It's a moving sheet of ice. I know this is only our third day of Earth science, but um, how can you tell? That's an inference. And I say it's an inference because, yeah, I, I, I could certainly make that claim, but I don't really have any evidence to back that up right now. So that's really the dividing line between observation and inference. An observation, you can prove it. You have fact. An inference, you need evidence. When we make inferences, sometimes we're wrong. When those inferences are believed by large groups of people, they result in misconceptions. Here's a misconception that coal forms diamonds. You may have heard of that. It's totally wrong. Coal does not form diamonds. Diamonds actually form from another carbon source called graphite. Somewhere along the way, that information was passed out um, and people believed it. And to this day, people believe that. 
Another science skill, classification. You do this all the time. Uh, that's grouping together similar observations and inferences to make the study of objects and events in the environment easier to understand. It's when we take things that are similar and we put them together, or things that are different and we move them apart. In Earth science, there's a couple examples that we will look at, like planets and stars and minerals and storms and energy types and rocks and landscapes, galaxies. They're all classified into different groups. There are different groups of planets. There are different types of stars. There are different types of galaxies. That's to make studying them much easier because we have similarities amongst those groups. Of course, in science, we have to measure. It's another science skill. It's kind of an umbrella term because when we measure, it's a means of expressing an observation with greater accuracy or precision. And when we measure, we have to measure accurately, of course, but it's a way of communicating uh, an observation to other people. One type of measuring quantity is length, right? We use a ruler to measure the distance between two points. And when we measure length in the uh, science classroom, we're measuring it in the metric system and the unit for length are meters. Meters would be the central unit, but I can change that to centimeters, I can change that to millimeters, I can change that to kilometers. Um, another quantity is mass, how much matter is in an object. That's uh, measured in grams and in the picture you can see a triple beam balance. When we measure mass, we're, we're really taking uh, an uh, account of how many atoms are in something. It's not to be confused with weight. When we go to the doctor's office and they say, get on the scale, I'm going to take your weight, they're really taking your mass. Um, weight is the force of gravity uh, pulling down on you on Earth. That's what weight really is. We kind of mixed up those terms a long time ago and we, uh, you know, have never corrected that. But when we measure mass using a triple beam balance or something like that, we record it in grams. And usually, especially when we talk about the Earth and space, things get converted upwards to kilograms. Another quantity is time. We all know what time is. It's the sense of how things happen one after another or the duration of an event. If we want to measure how long an earthquake took, we use time. If we want to know the cycle of sunspots that occur uh, on the sun, we use time. It's an important measurement. And obviously the units we would use are minutes, seconds, hours, days, years. And then there's even more divisions of time that I won't ask you to know now that account for bigger chunks. Another measuring quantity is volume. That's the amount of space that an object occupies. Volume is determined in two ways. It's a three-dimensional measurement. So if we want the volume of a solid object, uh, we can find it by using water displacement. That's basically when you take the object and you drop it into a graduated cylinder or a container of water, the water that's displaced, that's pushed out or pushed up. The difference before and after is the volume of that object. That's just one way. Another way to measure volume of a solid object is by using length, width, and height. If you multiply those three quantities, you get the three-dimensional space that an object takes up. So depending on how you measured the volume, the units could be centimeters cubed, like length, width, height. They could be milliliters for a liquid, or they can be liters, which is a bigger quantity that we use also for liquids. But Either way, they're all interchangeable because they all represent the metric quantities of volume. All right, almost finished. Uh, density. Density is probably one of the most important topics we'll cover all year. If you fast forward about a week from now, we'll be heavy into density. It's the mass per unit volume of a substance. If you, ha if you know the mass and you know the volume, you divide those two numbers, you get the density. It can be used to determine a lot of things. Most important, importantly, the buoyancy. In this picture, you can see a density column, liquids layered by their density. Density means how closely packed together the atoms in a substance are. The closer they are, the higher the density. The further they are, the lower the density. And that can determine whether something will sink or float in water. Temperature. That's the measurement of the average kinetic energy of atoms. 
Three scales are used to measure temperature, and we will use all three. Kelvin, probably for the hottest objects that exist in the universe, like stars. Uh, the Celsius, which is the metric quantity. We still will use that often. And then Fahrenheit. If you watch the weather report, they're recording it or reporting it in the Fahrenheit temperature, which is more of the customary or United States version. Either way, we use a thermometer to measure temperature. No matter what, all the measurements that we just talked about are made by comparing to a standard unit. For instance, if you use a ruler, you'll notice that the ruler has lines on it and then are broken up into what we call graduations or little um, you know, uh, units. That's a standard. And when we put that up against something to get its length, when we're using a ruler, we're comparing the object to a standard. What we said, this is how big a centimeter is. We're using that to compare. All right, that's an important uh, aspect of communicating our observations because we all agreed this is how big a centimeter is. So that's what we're going to use when we compare. No matter what, in science, we always use the metric system because the metric system is a universal system and a universal language that all scientists agree on. So when we talk about how tall Mount Everest is, you may see it in kilometers and be like, I don't know how tall that is in feet or miles. So there's some quick conversions you can do, but you just have to get used to the terms. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for listening.